Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to WePIC Roundtable 2022. We are delighted to meet you all today. I'm your host, Su Jin Ha from International Center for the Interpretation and Presentation of World Heritage Sites, in short, WePIC. Uh, since we are officially established earlier this year, we've hosted diverse online meetings and events associated with heritage interpretation and presentation. As one of them, we are happy to host this roundtable event and invite you all today. Throughout the past project that WP has conducted during the last two years, we realized the inevitability of the Sonus and heritage originating from different understanding and interpretation of heritage. So in this roundtable, we will be trying to step forward to how we should deal with the Sonus and heritage sites, including word heritage. Uh, we picked Roundtable 2022 uh, comprises three presentations and open discussion session where we look into different heritage sites with diverse voices and narratives. Celebrating the 50th anniversary of the World Heritage Convention, we expect this roundtable to pro provide good discussions for a better present and future for heritage and the people who appreciate heritage. Before beginning that roundtable, I would like to introduce two very special remarks. First, I would like to present the opening remarks from Mr. Jason Lee, Deputy Director General of WIPI. He, he has sent us the video of his opening remarks. Shall we? 반갑습니다, 여러분. UNESCO 세계유산 국제 해석 설명센터 사무국장 이재순입니다. 2022년은 세계유산 협약이 채택된 지 50주년이 되는 뜻깊은 해입니다. 이러한 뜻깊은 해 유네스코 세계유산 국제해석설명센터가 공식적으로 출범하여 세계유산의 해석과 설명에 대한 연구와 역량 강화 그리고 네트워킹을 지속적으로 이어갈 수 있게 되어 기쁘게 생각합니다. 지난 3년간 전 세계적으로 유례없는 팬데믹을 겪으면서 우리는 글로벌 연대의 중요성을 그 어느 때보다도 절실히 느끼고 있습니다. 이러한 연대의 경험과 함께 세계유산 협약 50주년을 맞이하여 우리 센터는 조화롭고 평화로운 현재와 미래를 위해 다양한 가치와 의미를 가진 유산을 어떻게 해석하고 설명해야 하는지 함께 고민해 나가고자 합니다. 이에 이번 국제 라운드 테이블은 세계유산을 포함한 유산의 해석과 설명에 있어 연대의 중요성에 대하여 연구자와 현장 전문가들의 경험과 교훈을 함께 나눌 수 있는 소중한 기회가 될 것입니다. 이러한 논의를 바탕으로 앞으로 유네스코 세계유산 국제해석설명센터가 추구해 나가고자 하는 유산 해석과 설명의 기반을 마련할 수 있기를 바랍니다. 이번 라운드 테이블에 참가해 주신 저명하신 학자들과 일선에서 노력하고 계시는 현장 전문가들께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much for your kind words, Ms. Lee. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Susan Lee, Head of Research and Development Office at WIPIC for welcoming remarks. Good morning and good afternoon all. I'm Susan Lee, the Head of Research and Development Office of WIPIC. I would like to thank you all to participate and contribute to this very important topic of our round table. Solidarity is a key factor in sharing heritage values and expanding the benefits of heritage by leading us to the inclusive interpretation. I would like to thank all of you um, to participate in this meeting. And we expect today's valuable presentation and extensive discussions would enlighten our center in setting out our future research topics as well. Thank you again for all presenters discussant and moderator and all participants.
Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your warm welcome. Before we move on, I would like to announce that WIPIC Roundtable 2022 is now being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel with English and Korean subtitles later. So please keep your eyes on our social media to check the update. Now I'm honored to introduce our moderator, Dr. Hyun Kyung Lee. Dr. Lee is an assistant professor at Critical Global Studies Institute at Seogang University in South Korea. Her research interests include difficult heritage in East Asia, transnational heritage networking, heritage interpretation, and peace building at UNESCO. Also, as a heritage professional, she is an expert member of the Cultural Heritage Committee in C Cultural Heritage Administration of Korea and a member of the Korean Committee for UNESCO Memory of the World. Dr. Lee, I would like to invite you here. Uh, I'm so honored to participate in this meaningful, significant roundtable event uh, as a moderator. In order to discuss the solidarity, in heritage interpretation and presentation, the WIPIC Roundtable invites three presenters and three discussants. Let me briefly introduce them to you. The first presenter is the Dr. Vishnia Kishic. She is assistant professor at the Faculty of Sports and Tourism and at UNESCO Chair Master Program in Cultural Policy and Management Belgrade. As a researcher, educator, and practitioner in heritage and museum field, her work focuses on relations between heritage and politics, in particular heritage dissonance, memory conflicts, and reconciliation. Next, our second presenter is Mr. Zeze Lema Joseph. She is an architect and urbanist, set and production designer and museologist. As a senior program manager, she oversees the coalition's activities in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Zeze also leads much of the coalition's global thematic work, including the Migration Museums Network. Next, our third presenter is Dr. Ali Musaie. He is a writer, researcher, and world-renowned heritage professional. Since he joined UNESCO in 1996, he has contributed to building up diverse African heritage programs. He was coordinator of the UNESCO Culture of Peace program in the Horn of Africa, and he also was the head of the history and memory for dialogue department and directed two meaningful UNESCO programs, the Roots of Dialogue and the General and Regional Histories Project. Next, our first discussant is the Mr. Jakub Novakovsky. He is the director of the Galatia Jewish Museum in Krakow, Poland from 2010. From early year, he was compelled to research the history of his neighborhood and he graduated from the Department of Jewish Music Stories at the Jagiellonian University, where he wrote a thesis on Jewish resistance in Krakow during the Second World War. As a museum director, he endeavors to not only diversify the narratives of the Holocaust and the Jewish local history, but also foster intercultural dialogue and cultural education. Next, our second discussant is Dr. Shumei Wang. She is associate professor at the Graduate Institute of Building and Planning National Taiwan University. Her research area intersects recovery planning, indigenous studies, and heritage studies in East Asia. She published several books related to difficult heritage in East Asia. For example, Heritage, Memory, and Punishment in 2019, and the Frontiers of Memory in 2022. Next, the last but not least, our third presenter 
is the Dr. Stephanie Luta. She is a social anthropologist and museum professional working at SOAS, University of London. She is a co-investigator in the project titled Heritage as Peacemaking, Placemaking, the Politics of Solidarity and Erasure. Dr. Luta, whose research focus is on Nepal, is at the moment co-organizing a summer school on urban heritage mining in Kathmandu. Now, I'd like to invite <laughs> Dr. Vishna Kishik as a first presenter. Dr. Kishik, it's your floor. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, good day and good morning and good evening, everyone, depending on where from you're listening to us. Um, it is a great pleasure to be part of this panel and to actually be able to reflect on some of the experiences and um, projects that have been going on in the former and the, the post Yugoslav context and in the Balkans where, I, where I'm based and where I'm doing most of my uh, research and activist work as well. Um, for this particular occasion, uh, I've chosen to actually focus on very particular projects because in the context of former Yugoslavia, there's actually numerous um, initiatives and kind of heritage dissonances and peace building projects that could be a really good topic for today's meeting. But most of them have been led by civil society actors and non-state actors. So I wanted to focus on the one that succeeded in bringing official administrations, ministries of culture and cultural heritage, as well as uh, institutes for heritage protection in the whole region um, to do a common transnational nomination for UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, and the object of this was um, the medieval monolithic tombstones called Stachyks, which covered the span from 15th century, from 12th century to the 16th century. They abound in the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but could also be found on the bordering territories, um, Serbia, Croatia, and Montenegro. There's around seven, 70,000 of them and um, spread across more than 3,000 3, sites. Um, cards from limestone featuring a very wide range of decorative motifs and inscriptions, interesting epitaphs, and uh, featured in quite impressive natural surroundings. So not in the urban centers, but actually very much outside of the urban centers. Offer us very interesting glimpses into medieval understanding of life and death in the region. So these monuments have been preserved both during, due to their monumentality, but also due to the fact that there's a lot of folk superstition that surrounds them, um, folk stories and traditions that are connected to them. And they have also been continually an inspiration for artists and poets, especially from the 19th century onwards. But at the same time, despite being dispersed across four of the Balkan countries, uh, they have been the object of dissonant discourses and actually discourses with ethnic pre prefixes. Um, and that is due mainly to the birth of 19th century idea of national nation states, different national historiographies that have produced different interpretations of stagex, also in relation to the specific religions, specific ethnicities, namely Serbian, um, Croatian, and Bosnian. And all those kind of confronting interpretations um, have been again reignited during the wars in the 1990s in following the breakup of Yugoslavia. We can move to the next slide. So the breakup of Yugoslavia is actually the context in which this whole transnational nomination takes place because it is in this moment that the distance of, of Stachyx and the contestations around it became again renewed. Um, in the search for new, very clean ethno-national identities and new memory wars, um, so basically, uh, stages have again became quite uh, dissonant and quite contested um, at that moment. And um, the very um, kind of process of the very idea of transnational nomination process that took place from 2012 to 2016 was to actually 
bridge again these four countries, previous warring states of Bosnia, Croatia, Montenegro, and Serbia, um, in a cooperation that took more than five years and that um, took of quite a strong engagement from the UNESCO Antena office in Sarajevo, leading to successful inscription in 2016. Um, we can move to the next slide. So the nomination process itself had quite a heavy political support. It has been the first official state-run uh, cooperation since the wars, including both the ministry of each of the four states, um, as well as numerous heritage professionals. So the prospects of having a heritage ins inscribed to the World Heritage List with all the recognition and prestige and tourism attracting powers had acted as quite a good in incentive for all four states to cooperate and to somehow find a common ground on, on state checks. And for UNESCO, this transnational nomination has been really an exercise in sort of proving that World Heritage List, and especially transnational nomination, can be a tool for heritage-led reconciliation, especially in moments where um, there have been wars or ongoing memory conflicts between different states and among different states. So instead of leaning to different contested national meanings um, of all four states, the nomination process during these four years had succeeded in, in crafting this discourse of interrelations and hybridity. And we can move to the next slide. No, to the, yeah, sorry, to the previous one. Can we move back? Yeah, so as you see here, statics are painted as um, being this monument that kind of transgresses both religious, class, and ethnic divisions that are monuments of everyone and of um, all classes in the region. And somehow these kind of um, dissonant and contested interpretations have been quite avoided and only mentioned in the nomination process. We can go to the next slide. In doing so, there's been many achievements of this process and we can discuss them later on. But the most important one was that Stachex really connected heritage professionals that were involved in the process itself, creating new trust, new links between them, new sort of solidarities. Um, it also acted as a space for regional cooperation and really succeeded in kind of denationalizing or de-ethnicizing um, the contested discourses in the region. Um, it also secured the long-term public protection for state checks, and these are all achievements to be applauded. Uh, but we can move to the next slide and um, see some of the limitations. Um, in the research that I've been doing kind of extensively of this case, um, it was seen that kind of World Heritage as a framework itself tried to lock one discourse, so tried to lead to a consensus that has been a false consensus. Um, and has silenced dissonances that still remain in the region, but are just not visible in the nomination itself. Um, therefore, it allowed for avoiding problematization of regional heritage conflicts and kind of trying to um, nudge them or hide them, at least for the purposes of the nomination. It also focused a lot on materiality and objectivity and scientific issues related to heritage and downplayed the centrality of interpretations and actually centrality of the meanings and values that different groups attach to these monuments. And in that, in that manner, it also avoided the essence and the centrality of interpretation and educational programs further on in the management plan and in the ongoing cooperation between the states. Um, so just to um, finally conclude with some of the lessons, we can go to the next slide. Um, so on one hand, we can see that UNESCO World Heritage List can act as this kind of force to bring about dialogue and cooperation and reconciliation if it's used in a good manner and if there is time for the cooperation and negotiations to happen. Um, it also uh, acted as a place in which recognizing and working with dissonance would be much better than avoiding it, as was uh, here the case. Um, so more entering into conversation, more dealing with denaturalizing the basis of this cultural violence and contested interpretations and working towards new ways of understanding and plurality of understanding. It also shows us that uh, managing heritage sites and memory conflicts 
um, has to be done through much more focus on heritage interpretation and much more focus on its presentation and education um, in the period to come in order to actually bring different actors together and build bridges and solidarity among um, the plurality of actors and historic narratives instead of silencing them. So, thank you. That's um, just a brief sketch of what was going on from my side. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting case to show how the national transnational nomination uh, gave us like uh, gives us uh, some ideas of a solidarity and also possibility and limitations too. Thank you very much. Our three discussants is also ready to give you some questions. So Yakub. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kisic. Uh, it was very, very interesting. And, and, and my question is actually um, something that uh, all three of us discussants were, were interested in. Uh, I mean, what were the dissonances involved in that nomination? Would, um, would in your opinion, the same process could uh, be implemented in the context of, for example, Russian-Ukrainian um, conflict, war, or Palestinian-Israeli conflicts, or uh, other situations where actually national narratives do not agree on the meaning or, or managing of, of the sites? Yeah, I would say it could actually have quite a big influence on how uh, we can deal with conflicts between Russia and Ukraine and Israel and Palestine, at least um, the much I know about the conflicts there. Um, and as in many other cases here, the issue was that um, medieval Balkans was a um, territory of borders that have been shifting constantly and nation states and ethnicities kind of living together constantly rearranging their own practices and rulers and so on. And suddenly you get the 19th century in this idea of kind of clean ethnic state, ethnic nation state in which everyone wants to draw the borders and want to make their countries the biggest possible. So the disputes around heritage and the meaning of heritage and who claims it to be theirs are actually connected to the fight for resources and more territories in the region, which is kind of very similar to what is going on between Russia and Ukraine at the moment with loads and loads of different um, historical recollections being uh, put in the dispute and also what's going on with Israel and Palestine. So yeah, I could go into more details about what exactly were the dissonances, but the dissonances were not connected only to the historiographies of Serbian nation state, Bosnian nation state and Croatian nation state in particular, but actually Kind of civil society actors, different interest groups, and so on, people in forums and medias were also having their own interpretations that kind of tweaked a little bit statics in this, in this or that manner. And it's interesting that statics were actually promoted as this common South Slavic heritage during Yugoslav times. And as soon as Yugoslavia dissolved, the process of renationalizing and re ethnicizing statics was actually happening. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Dr. Shumei Hua, are you ready? Um, thank you, Dr. Yi, and thank you, Dr. Kisi, for the great um, pre um, presentation. Um, my question is about uh, heritage interpretation. Uh, what would be the reason to prevent the role of heritage interpretation to play out more uh, in this particular case? Um, and I'm, I'm curious, is there any ongoing effort to fill the gap? Mm. So I would say on one hand, um, discussing it openly has been seen as too risky but by all the member states. There was one interpretation that was agreed upon in 2013 the nomination should have proceeded in 2014. And then one of the sides said, no, it's not Serbian enough. Like the Serbian side hasn't been represented enough. And that was like, they were going playing ping pong, especially the national actors and also the heritage professionals that were put in the position of representing their own nation state and their own national interests, even though that hasn't been explicitly expected from them. But I think just the framework of um, UNESCO in which it's the public authorities and nation states that are nominating the sites and that should then negotiate their own dissonances is the one that was kind of pushing both heritage professionals as well as UNESCO representatives 
to just avoid dealing with these dissonances. So dissonances are mentioned in one sentence, but then avoided altogether. And this kind of meaning of heritage being a bit of, Stachek's being a bit of heritage for everyone is actually serving the purpose of not bringing in these disputes and dissonances. Um, what was interesting, I was getting these ideas from um, UNESCO representatives that actually, if they were to put heritage dissonance explicitly in the nomination, that then this should have been seen as a risk that should be mitigated in the management plan and also the risk to outstanding universal value, which expects you to valorize kind of a single big narrative. So it is all a lot of things at the same time, but I would say also the UNESCO discourse, which is still kind of this authorized heritage discourse as we know it, that wants to have this stable fixed narratives then then can be protected in the management plans. And I would say this has to be changed and I hope this would be changed in the future as UNESCO's kind of position on these issues is changing as well. But thank you for an inspiring question. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. It's like, I would like to listen to more about your responses, but uh, shall we move to Stephanie's question? Hello, yes, absolutely fascinating. And just following on um, what you've just uh, started to explain, is peace a precondition for a transnational identity-based heritage nomination? I would say no, and hopefully no, because I think in many cases, actually heritage field and heritage professionals could be ahead of the nation state politics and conflicts and actually trying to steer these common dialogues and mutual interpretations um, and works toward, work towards heritage profession, protection and mutual understanding. But I think what is limiting in this sense is that actually um, it is again nation states and ministries who should ratify the nomination process and that in many cases impedes the proceeding of transnational nominations as such. So I think some other methods have been much quicker and much more agile to work with reconciliation, especially in the post-Yugoslav context, for example, and in the Balkan context that had to do with civil society actors and uh, many non-state initiatives or just single institution initiatives and, and networks. Mm. But hopefully that can change. Thank wow. you for a really important question. Very important question, and uh, it's that there are lots of dimension, dimensions, and dynamics in uh, the trans nominations processes, and uh, but uh, we can see that how the UNESCO can work with uh, multiple like uh, agents and actors in the heritage interpretation is a very significant matter. Thank you very much. Then, uh, shall we move to the second presentation now? So, uh, Mr. Mr. Zeze Lema Joseph. So hello everyone, good morning. My name is Jeje Leme Joseph and I'm the Senior Program Manager for Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean with the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Thank you for having me here today to share our perspective on this important conversation. So for those of you who don't know our work, the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience is a global network of historic sites, museums and memory initiatives connecting past struggles to today's movements for human rights and social justice. Um, we help sites around the world better engage their communities in building peaceful future for, by providing training, networking and grants. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we are a global organization uh, spread all around the world. So in order to best share sites of conscience lessons, challenges and experiences in uh, solidarity and participation in interpretation processes, I'd like to start with a reflection about uh, the idea of solidarity in heritage interpretation as a means to overcome entailed dissonance on heritage sites. So next slide, please. Um, overcoming dissonance can be seen as either the pursuit of a unison or maybe alternatively as the pursuit of a dynamic harmony of voices, experiences and narratives. 
So Sites of Conscience strongly believes in building solidarity through a multiplicity of perspectives and voices, cooperation and power sharing. So I wanna talk from this perspective today, which is our expertise lies. Um, so in a dynamic harmony of voices, uh, dynamic implies a non-static understanding of the past and how it impacts present and future. Harmony implies equity and diversity within those narratives. So this approach requires a fluid assessment of meaning making, providing opportunities for this continued and constructive dialogue and negotiation between parties. So the goal from a side of conscious perspective uh, is not to meld our perspectives into one that can be seen as a singular, but to lift the very diversity of these understandings and truths in a way that it reflects the complexity of these historical narratives and lived experiences. So this leaves room for then the identification and amplification of shared understandings amongst the diversity of these perspectives and the, in a process that then leads to bridging difference and promoting solidarity and peace. But on the other hand, if the goal is to create a static unison, then we risk privileging one perspective over the other and endanger a sincere and sustainable engagement of community members and others. And it's, it's what uh, Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie calls the single stories that we are talking about here as well. But they are simplistic, incomplete, and often false narratives that exclude the experiences, needs, and voices of many groups, especially minority groups, and ultimately contribute to divisive rhetoric, negative stereotype, discrimination, hatred, and violence. So that is something we need to start exploring more maybe in interpretation and heritage and world heritage sites. So next slide, please. So uh, we believe that this is a great moment to start uh, evaluating or looking into how interpretation of world heritage sites has been done. It's been inclusive. We can't, we don't think we can establish a true long-term relevance and sustainability in world heritage sites without infusing this community ownership and meaning making, uh, uh, decision-making and the future plans of the site very early in the process of nomination. Uh, so by building this ground up process uh, that is centered in cooperation and co-creation, then this can become early a path that is a shared path and or blueprint for solidarity going forward. So on the other hand, our experience shows that when nomination processes are led from the top down, disputes for narrative protagonism quickly erode uh, the ability to build harmony and to build solidarity. Moving from dissonance into a dynamic harmony is what we call at Sites of Conscience, it's a path to becoming a Sites of Conscience. This is not an easy or fast process, and we understand that our sites are at very different stages in this path. So a site of conscience doesn't become a site of conscience because uh, they, uh, they are already, they have achieved this fully inclusive, ground up, holistic approach, but because they have a clear commitment to follow that path hand in hand with their communities and ongoing process as an ongoing process. And then they also want to develop these practices and it trickles down through organizational technical practices for the benefit of everybody involved. So next slide, please. So we have worked to that end uh, over the last few years closely with uh, some World Heritage sites, which are sites of conscience. Maison des in Senegal is the first World Heritage, Heritage site in Africa uh, as a founding member of the coalition um, and is a key site capturing the magnitude and the brutality of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, Maison des was struggling to meet the needs of its growing visitors. A few years ago, so in March 2015, uh, the coalition collaborated with Maison d'Esclave uh, on a comprehensive needs assessment, resulting in this uh, kind of a multi-year plan to support sites development into a regional and global center for excellence on visitor engagement on issues of freedom, migration, and slavery. So a multi-party team uh, from involving from government to academics and members of the community were working with Maison d'Esclave to support this process and this dynamic transformation. Uh, and the project includes an update to the permanent exhibition that is based on recent uh, research and reflects today's understandings of the site and of the transatlantic slave. And at present, the exhibition of Maison des Club that really not incorporate the latest research or, and very nuanced understandings of the history of the house as it is understood today. So through this multi-perspective approach, 
uh, and dialogue methodology. We're helping, uh, we're hope, supporting this on this club in, in interpreting the difficult and emotionally charged nature of the exhibitions they have, and to also train the tour guides uh, that work with them to connect scholarship, site content, and the visitor personal experiences. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I also want to mention a project we launched in 2022 entitled Correcting the Record. And this project is aimed to document a one-of-a-kind methodology that will allow sites of conscience around the world to recalibrate their repositories, as we see, to amplify uh, silenced voices and promote more inclusive uh, narratives, mitigating discrimination and exclusion in the site. So this initiative will uh, help address the issue of official historic narratives, the singular narratives, and foster new understandings in that place. So correcting the record invited site six of conscience across the global south to develop case studies by revisiting their organizational practices and identifying gaps in their approaches to building these repositories in an inclusive manner. So after identifying underrepresented communities, then these sites are working with these communities to pilot case studies that they will web through which they will create on how to fill those gaps at the organization and how to work, learn to work and cooperate with communities going forward. So this framework is being tested by, by these organizations and in then will we hope that it will bring important learnings on moving dis from dissonance to a dynamic harmony of voices and that it can have important lessons also in terms of solidarity for world heritage sites. Uh, next slide, please. And once one of these sites is the Intercontinental Slavery Museum in Mauritius. Uh, which is developing a co-creation curatorial plan for an exhibition about marginalized Black Rastafari community in Mauritius. The museum is still in development and implementation and is premised on being fully inclusive of Mauritius histories and narratives of slavery and of the experience of the Afro-Malagasy community. But the museum team felt the need to open their practices while they're still in development to transition from what they feel is a very academic led uh, moment of their uh, development to a community focused uh, organizational commitment and that to start early in the process. So this project will help create then a, a framework of co-creation, uh, a co-creation for them for development of the museum's ex exhibitions and programs and management even going forward. So in summary, uh, Sites of Conscience believes that there is no fast nor easy route for creating solidarity to move from dissonance towards a dynamic harmony of voices and heritage practices, nor in world heritage nomination processes or any other process. It requires flexibility while maintaining focus. It re requires relinquishing power in favor of cooperation, negotiating perspectives towards a shared goal, moving away from Western centric cultural perspectives many times to embrace, embrace a diversity of perspectives. Uh, cultivating patience, endurance, and the willingness to live without definite answers to difficult questions, without the single story in the long run. And but we believe that the benefits that this process, when it's done collectively and in a, in a sensitive manner, can yield unparalleled results. That's where we believe and how we work. So as the African proverb says, uh, if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yes, your final remark is very encouraging. And I firmly believe that the words, the solidarity and the harmony is not a stative, but it's a dynamic and acts and processes. Thank you very much. Uh, Sherry start our discussion with the three discussants. Uh, our, the, Dr. Shumei Wang is the first, uh, have a first question to uh, Jeze. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was really touching. Um, um, so the, my question is about mechanism and founding. Um, the kind of multi-year evaluation that the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience did for the synagogue case, um, um, in, indeed, is very important um, to to sustain the site as a. a site of dynamic interpretation. Nevertheless, um, many sites, as we know, may stop short advancing their practices after being listed um, as national monuments or war heritage. 
and therefore close the door for a more dynamic, diversified interpretation. Um, so how did that the kind of project come to being? And who should sponsor this kind of uh, evaluation without too much intervention? It's a very important question. Uh, in the specific case of Maison d'Esclave, there was a, a confluence of factors that led to the project. So uh, there were needs identified by Maison d'Esclave. We had discussed with them, uh, sites of conscience, we have a, a very close relationship with them as a founding member. Um, and then uh, there was a visit by Mr. Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation uh, to uh, Maison d'Esclave and the Ford Foundation became interested in supporting the Zondas Club in a process of, of upgrade and revitalization to attend these needs. Um, so at that stage, then Maison des uh, and Sites of Conscience collaborated in, in developing this needs assessment that could be quite broad and, and inclusive uh, and involved Sites of Conscience and Senegalese specialists, especially, and developed a comprehensive proposal then with the outcomes of these assessment for this project, this upgrade project. Um, the project was jointly financed by the Foreign Foundation and the Senegal government. And this was a very uh, extremely important request by the Maison d'Esclave and the Senegalese part, uh, counterparts to ensure the ownership and leadership of the, of the, uh, the revitalization project to be uh, with Senegal. Uh, in addition, most specialists involved were Senegalese, and uh, we consider that the client is the Senegalese government. Um, so that was a process that ended up uh, bringing uh, many of these parts together, but the, the leadership stayed very clearly with the Senegalese counterparts. Uh, and who should fund such projects? I mean, ideally, those with a vested interest in the project should find or in, involved in the management should have the ability to fund them, especially local governments. But we know that governments always not always have those funds. So in that case, we need to make sure that whichever organization funds uh, or is interested in helping to fund that they have to do it. They have to accept a mechanism of work within the project that doesn't allow them to interfere with the views of the project or we have to ensure that they don't have any hidden agendas. Uh, so whoever the funder is, uh, those involved in the managed interpretation of the site, as well as the relevant community should be leading all decision making in the process. Uh, in the case of Maison d'Esclave, they made very sure that their voice and the Senegalese government's voice prevailed throughout all decisions in the project. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wow, it's like the mechanism and funding is a very important matter in heritage interpretation too. Thank you very much to touch the practical matter. And shall we move to the second question by Dr. Stefan Lothar? Yes, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I have a, a twofold question for you. So Mr. Novakovsky and I, we agree with the emphasis on the plurality of voices and the concept of dynamic harmony that the coalition highlights. However, we would like to understand how the coalition deals with A, narrations um, that are based on stereotypes and misconceptions, and B, with the co-curators who co-opt co and coerce. So in other words, um, do you, how do you position the project in relation to the dangers of misrepresentation and censorship? Okay, yes, it's, it's, it's a del very delicate uh, uh, work that needs to be done in regards to that. We are fully cognizant of all those risks. So I think important, we need to highlight that uh, the, bringing, the process of bringing a plurality of voices adopted by the sites of conscience uh, framework is community led. So this process, we're working with them to build capacity and methodologies and frameworks if they need for, to implement this ground up participatory process and how to be truly inclusive and representative. Also, this matters because they are, the, the, the stakeholders, the local communities are the ones who have the knowledge 
about these narratives. Uh, we try not, or we do not intervene or curate the process. We uh, work and endeavor to give tools, every tool necessary for this to happen if they don't have tools of their own. Uh, so we work with them to sometimes develop new tools and from the tools they have, or they can learn from the tools that we can offer. Uh, so community members that are trained for, for this mediation or curatorial position, um, usually is also not one, is more than one person. So you also have those many voices there. It's a, co it's a collective uh, that is looking into, uh, into, into uh, implementing this multi-perspective uh, approach. So by, at the end of the day is the plurality of voices themselves in this context that brings the necessary nuance of perspectives. And this, by having this nuance and this variety of perspectives and lies, they, but per se, this sheds a light on the contrast between what is a legitimate and sincere uh, account or uh, lived experience that's being narrated and an incomplete or stereotypical narration. So from this multi-perspective approach, when it's uh, done also using dialogue, it accommodates the diversity and it singles out in, in, in um, it's easier to single out the misconceived and stereotypical versions of this. So on the contrary, going back to Chimamanda's uh, responses, when you don't have enough voices, when you only have a singular voice, then this any version is up for grabs. You don't have the checks and balances. And also lastly, I mean, any process of such type has to have checks and balances uh, with the accuracy of historical events and facts and all the scientific processes that also go hand in hand with this. So there are checks and, checks and balances everywhere. It needs to be carefully done. Uh, and in terms of the coercers, uh, as supporters of the process, when we step, we we do step in in some points when we see that it's bluntly that there is a blunt coercion towards a certain point of view. Uh, but mostly, we try to keep a very keen eye and spot when that happens, uh, discuss the behavior, talk to the group ask them what they feel, how they feel about that, and try to help them redirect the process. So we don't go and intervene either. It's not our job to do that. We are there to support their process. Um, so I think that's, that's basically my response. Thank you very much for your details, like the answers to the responding to Dr. Stefan Salutas question. And it, Jakub, if you don't mind, could you please give a very quick question and also uh, JJ, could you please uh, give a bit shorter yes. answer to them? Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. Yes, thank you. Uh, I mean, again, this is uh, you, you, your work is, is universal and relevant also in the context of, of where I'm coming from. This is for the Jewish relations and the post Holocaust traumas. And I, 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 I fully agree that communities' participation is something that is extremely important. But sometimes this um, community participation um, inevitably risk reinforcing local uh, localism or, or tribalism and uh, therefore rejects the, the voice of the different that might challenge the, the, the boundary of the uh, so-called local community or pre-existing self, uh, self ideas. And, and, and in other cases, the communities may not be at all interested in, in remembering or discussing the past uh, or either of their own or, or the other. So have you worked in such environments? Um, um, yes, thank you for this question. I have worked uh, in a project in Brazil before the coalition. I was the coordinator of a collaboration between UNESCO and the city of Rio de Janeiro to develop a museum plan and interpretation plan for the Valongo Wharf, uh, with the surrounding neighborhood, Little Africa. And in this project, we faced a series of situations. This project was built from the beginning, uh, really community-driven, um, I was there as a facilitator, as a technician, similarly to how we operate a sites of conscience. Um, and even with a fully representative uh, staff, um, steering committee, scientific committee, entirely built around the black movement, around the local communities and the communities of, of relevance for that project. There was intense competition for protagonism and whose story that was, who had the right to tell the story, who should be leading the entire project, even though even the leaders up to the Secretary of Culture of Rio at the time 
was a black woman. So this uh, it was a fierce dispute that emerged. Um, and it, the, it halted the project in many ways and in many steps. But this, I saw this as a positive uh, aspect. It was very difficult, but it was positive because the conversations are reflective of, of the experiences they have, they live. There is no unified voice of the Black movement or, or of Black people in Brazil and what they've been through. Um, you can't force that, but that was an opportunity to discuss this variety of experiences and where they wanted to come from uh, in a project where these experiences could finally and uh, start breaking the denialism that Brazil has around the narratives uh, stemming from uh, enslavement of Black uh, of Africans. So, uh, it, so this was like, it, it had disputes of who, uh, who mattered, who didn't matter, and also what needed to be said. A lot of them didn't want uh, to focus the project on the aspect of, of, the, uh, of what of the war symbolizes in terms of a, a, a disembarkment place of Afri enslaved Africans, actually the, the part of the most disembarkment in the world, in the Americas, sorry. Um, but they wanted to focus on the narratives of resistance, of the narratives of the achievements of, of the contributions of Afro-Brazilians to what Brazil is today. Uh, but this also was an interesting discussion that was a, a necessary one. So had we had more time as the project got halted in the current Brazilian political context, but had we had more time, I believe that time and patience would have, would have created an, an amazing result in this process. You have to navigate through it. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, every, every, you can, you can meet corners and, and, and detours at every stop of every point of the way, but you have to work around it and find ways to carry on until you get the result that you, that you're supposed to, to try to achieve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yaku. A pleasure. Uh, Thank you. Yes. It's like a one more present presentation is waiting for us. So, Dr. Ali Musa Ie, are you ready to give us your paper? Um, speaking about uh, of solidarity in relation to the heritage of slavery may be considered inappropriate and even a little bit provocative, given the fact that the history, this history is precisely characterized by the most selfish, immoral, and criminal pursuit of, of profit. Indeed, slavery was one of the greatest uh, tragedy of humanity marked by barbaric uh, mistreatment of human beings, including children, women, elders. And so the, uh, the figure mentioned in the slide that I would like you to show, uh, give us an idea of the, of the scoop of, of this tragedy. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so as you can see, we have, uh, I mean, in terms of number is 50 million of African deported in different parts of the world, we have 120 to 150 millions of what we can call a collateral death during the raid in the village, the starving during the long march and the sea crossing, etc. So this crime against humanity was perpetuated generally with the general indifference. And even I can say with the general support of the population in countries that benefited from it. So that's why to discourage any gesture and feeling of solidarity towards the enslaved people, the beneficiaries of this business have, have called upon religious, art, science, uh, law to, to dehumanize the victim of their grief. And even a special vocabulary has been invited to, to bestialize and to comedify them. For instance, in the black code developed by, uh, by the slave nation, the, slave, uh, the enslaved people was called movable property, movable pro uh, properties uh, or ebony wood. So, and many of the, the thinkers of the, of the so-called the century of enlightenment have not shown a particular uh, solidarity with the, of the victim of, of slavery. Some of them, even participated in the construction of this uh, theory of the hierarchy of race and culture that, that served to, be, to justify this treatment. However, alongside the ethical and moral failure, there have been incredible expression of 
an act of solidarity towards the victim during the slavery time. And could you please show the next uh, uh, slide? Yes. And, uh, and here I would like to mention the admirable work undertaken by the ab abolitionist movement in the 18th and 19th century to denounce the barbarity of the slave system. I have to recall, I would like to recall the courageous activists who helped the enslaved African to escape the United States to Canada by, an, by inventing a very in, uh, ingen, uh, ingenious network of solidarity called the Underground Railroad. But I especially would like to recall the exemplary action of the, of the inhabitant of a small village in France called Champagne who in, in 1789 decide to address a complaint to their king in which they respectfully ask him to abolish slavery. And the written plea that submit to the king is really very, very, uh, I mean, um, moving. And I just would like to mention that. They say, the inhabitant and community of Champagne cannot think of the evils suffered by the black in the co uh, colonies without being filled with the deepest sorrow when they imagine their fellow human beings is still united to them by the double bound of religious being treated more harshly than the beast of burden. So this is very important uh, quotation because Mostly the, the common belief is that people are saying at that time slavery was legally and morally accepted. That was not true. And this is a concrete example that uh, villages, there are people who really condemn uh, that. So, but paradoxically, the expression of solidarity diminished and even disappeared after the abolition of slavery. And that is the paradox of this history. The instrument of torture has been, uh, uh, I mean, has been uh, uh, disappeared. Uh, the, the site of memory has been devastated, violated and transformed. The archives has been hidden uh, or destroyed to, to really organize the, 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 the silent. Fortunately, the oral tradition and the cultural expression of the enslaved people was the only that could survive this deliberate, uh, I mean, organized uh, uh, strategy to, to, to destroy the memory and the history of, of, of the slavery. And the, the other paradox of this uh, history is that it was this cultural expression that became now a marker of the post-slavery society and even important feature of their soft power. I mean, we all know how the, the United States have as using jazz or blues, or rock to, to expand their, their influence across the, uh, the world. And that was the production of the enslaved people who really helped them to, to do that. So, but uh, since the 80s, a new, a new waves of solidarity arose uh, to come to charm with, with, with this history. Um, however, Many of the concerned countries have chosen to promote only the achievement of the white abolitionist, uh, uh, abolitionist, ignoring the resistance and contribution of the enslaved people for their emancipation. For instance, the Haitian Revolution, which was the first and the only victory of enslaved people over their oppression, was completely silenced and canceled from history curriculum across the Western world. Therefore, one of the great obstacles for the consolidation of solidarity is the capacity and the willingness of the concerned country to change their narrative, national narratives, to reconsider the historical figure and heroes, and to revisit it, uh, uh, to revisit their museum and historical site. We have heard recently about the controversy around the, the removal of monument dedicated to historical figure who advocate uh, for slavery in the US, in the UK, in France, in Portugal, in Netherlands, and in different other countries. So how these countries prepare, how are these countries prepared to accommodate the rights to memory of a large portion of the citizens who are claiming 
to exercise in conformity of the principle of uh, of uh, uh, of the their uh, democratic institution. How are they prepared to accommodate that claims? How serious can policy for recognition of reconciliation be taken if public spaces continue to be overcrowded with monuments and memorials dedicated to people who advocate and who promote the slavery? How museums, history curricula, site of memories can continue to display colonial mystification and representation, which constitute a denial of the past suffering of large part of the citizens. That were the question that UNESCO slavery project was confronted with from its inception. The project is now called Road of Enslaved People. It has was created and it, and it was based of this of the fact that ignoring or obscuring major historical event constitute in itself an obstacle to peace, reconciliation and cooperation. So I would like to conclude my, my intervention by calling how this project, which I have the, I had the honor to, to, to direct to during 15 years, are addressed the challenges of reconciliation and solidarity. Please, can you show the last uh, slide? So from the beginning, the project has clearly posed the ethical and moral stakes of the slavery to help the different stakeholders to understand that the remembrance of the slave trade is not intended to stir up a painful and traumatic past with the aim of producing guilty. It is a necessary move to recognize a common heritage that has determined us and can allow us to better understand certain evils of today's work, such as the discrimination and racism. So I think the project has succeeded to, to open up the, the project like that, the issue. The project also have, from the beginning, have, have put the issue of slave trade and slavery at the global level and succeed to impose it as an international issue. And this orientation has helped to deracialize the slave trade and, and slavery and present it as a tragedy of, for the whole humanity which have shaped our modern world. The Slavery Project also has always begun its activity with a, the scientific approach, because that is the approach that really helped us to distance from the, the emotion and perhaps to, and to recover and, and, and to transcend all the, the polemics about this history. The project also has developed a holistic uh, perspective of, of this uh, issue uh, by also tackling the, I mean, the preservation of memory, the, the educational uh, aspect, the, 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 the contribution of the enslaved people to the progress, etc. So it was really a holistic dimension that has been privileged. The project also contributed to the awareness about the necessity to engage dialogue healing and reparation processes that would facilitate recognition, reconciliation, social cohesion, and living together in post-slavery uh, society. So I think we can say that today there is more and more countries that are ready to open these tragic pages of their history and to try to consider this memory into their commemorative um, um, agenda. And I think the now a new pages are open and every uh, and I think and we hope that these countries will really begin to write a new books about their this history, this particular history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very insightful presentation. And then that gives us a lesson to uh, rethink how our attitude should be to treat the difficult heritage and complex history. Uh, so we are going to have a very short discussion. So Dr. Stefanie Lothar, are you ready to give, a, give him the first question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, that was a fantastic presentation and I wish we would have much more time to discuss this thoroughly. Um, the first question that I would ask you 
is um, you've spoken to an add-on uh, approach in interpretation and also um, perhaps as a revolution. So um, taking the second approach um, in, I would like to ask you, um, as underrepresentation in material culture related to slavery is a problem in national collections, um, which goes hand in hand with the active concealment of dark history in national collections and archives. I would like to ask, how can we use national collections and colonial archives today to display the techniques of concealment and hiding historical truth? I think, yes, I think it's very interesting to use the same colonial archives and the same, uh, 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 the same uh, material that has been used to silence uh, this history to be used to reveal uh, uh, this history is very interesting. And I think, yes, there is many ways of, of, uh, to do that. The first, <coughs> one of the first would be, for instance, when there are permanent or even temporary exhibition in museums in sight of, of memory, that uh, the, the interpretation of the enslaved people or the descendant of the enslaved, uh, enslaved people be critically uh, showcase in uh, next to the the interpretation and the narratives of the dominant uh, you know narratives. Uh, that that is another a way of showing at, uh, an archives saying what these archives how these archives has been used to tell what the society the dominant society want to tell, and then give the interpretation of the marginalized. Uh, uh, population which have suffered from uh, th this history just next to that so that the visitors can really compare they have in the middle the archives and then they have the different the, the voices of the interpretation that is one way of doing any exhibition uh, about the slavery because so far when we make we have exhibition of slavery it was the scent the expert who do it and sometimes have this presentation of interpreting on behalf of the of the marginalized community what should be there. And I think it will be good to go to the communities to say what they want to see in this exhibition and what will be their 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 feelings and interpretation of that particular archives. That's what one way to to do it. Another way to do it is to have a kind of a three three dimension. You have the dominant interpretation, of course you have the archives and the material, you have the dominant interpretation, you may have uh, also associate historian from the marginalized community and from the dominant group to also with the same historical fact to show how they interpret. And I think that's a way of creating what we are talking all, uh, all this day is the plural and pluralistic interpretation and perspective of uh, one clear, uh, particular historical fact but giving the possibility to visitors to, to make their own opinion about by having the different uh, version. I think that's a way of uh, using the same archives, uh, colonial archives that have been used to conceal uh, this truth to reveal it in different manner. Thank you so much. So, so we can see that how the, the power relations between the presentation and interpretation too and the exhibition. And it's very difficult to put the, reach the, put the good balance of the plus pluralistic voices in the exhibition, but it's, we should make an effort. Uh, so, uh, Yaku, could you please unmute? Yes, sorry. Um, well, thank you for this uh, excellent and uh, again very relevant um, uh, presentation. And and those tensions that you've described are are something that we've witnessed over the last few years across the world. And I was wondering how does your your project relate to those movements like Black Lives Matters or or other social movements that uh, are bringing into light and, and challenge the systematic racism, discrimination, or inequality um, experience in the past, um, uh, but also today by the black people. I mean, this is not only something that we witness in the US, but also in South Africa or across the Europe uh, through uh, toppling of, of the statutes uh, across the cities. Yes, um, I think 
from uh, thank you for your question from the beginning i mean the slavery project was linked to the movement which uh, tried to fought the the social injustice inherited from uh, the slavery and then from the colonization from the beginning in fact the project was created but especially to 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 study and to understand the root cause of racism and discrimination uh, today so from the beginning, the project has uh, undertaken uh, research. Uh, um, um, we produce a series of, of publications. We, we, we produce uh, films to really uh, show that link between the, uh, the uh, racial prejudices, discrimination and racism, and the history of, of, of slavery and, uh, uh, and of the slave trade. More, more profoundly, the project tried to to reflect on what we call the racial order that came out from this history. You know, this racial order that was established in the 18th century at the same moment of the capitalism system. So the, the project studied that. And, and I think it, it really uh, gave a lot of inspiration to, to our, a lot of mov um, movement uh, against uh, racism and, and, and discrimination in, in different countries. You know, for instance, in the, in the Latin America and Jajid, she know very well in, in, the, in the Latin America, they call that the pigmentocracy, you know, this, the, the hierarchy that is built on the, on the color of your, of your skin. The lighter you are, the, the, the above you are. So it is a whole pigmentocracy in these countries that has, the project has tried to fold. In South Africa, of course, we call it uh, apartheid. In the French colony, they call it the code of indigenity. Uh, of in, uh, indigenity. Uh, and in the US is the, uh, segregation. So the project was really from the beginning uh, created to, 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 to be, uh, I mean, a theoretical and scientific basis to understand all that kind of, of, of moments. So it is very linked and of course, even the fact that to question the, the historical figure that are in the, in the public space was one of the claim of the project that the country is really serious with this history should reconsider the statue, the name of, of roles, the street that they are giving to unslavery because it is against the, their own constitution. They can't uh, valorize that kind of uh, personality while those who fought for the, the freedom, who fought for for the uh, abolition are not very uh, sufficiently known, especially from coming from the enslaved people. So there is a big debate now going on in the UK, in, in France, in the Netherlands to really question what this, this, uh, those modern society, what they want to, to showcase as a national narratives. And so this is a big issue I think that is, uh, and we hope that uh, we can have uh, other results, not only the, the crisis and the, in the street, the pro uh, protestation, but really change in the policy making and really change in the, in the, in the national narratives. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> so because of the time limit, and then we, uh, we, go, we, are going to, um, we are going to move to the next question. And Dr. Shumei Huang. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. B. Thank you for, uh, for Ali for the, the really interesting, important case um, sharing. Um, my question is about um, remembering and living cultural expressions among the uh, descendants of the victims. Um, Assuming that uh, there are particularly those who may voluntarily remain silent um, due to long existing trauma um, and fear. Um, so I wonder um, uh, what would be the keys to facilitate uh, their remembering? Yes, I don't know if I really understood your, your, your question, but what I can say, in the case of the, the slave, uh, slavery is that the victims have not only used the, the, the cultural, their cultural expression to, to resist the deshumanization process in which, uh, to which they were uh, subjected 
or even to to survive spiritually and physically uh, in, in the very hardship uh, of, of the slavery. But they use also this cultural uh, expression as a mean to fight the slavery itself. Because as you may know, through their cultural uh, uh, expression, they pass coded message for the Maroons uh, about uh, how to fight against slavery. You know, all, for instance, the, the drums were, uh, were forbidden by the enslavers. You know why? Because the enslaved people used the drums to pass message and to communicate about the position of the military, to give information to the Maroons, uh, to attack. So, and it, it was forbidden by, by the enslavers. The gospels, you know, songs was also another way of uh, of really uh, passing a coded uh, message uh, from plantation to plantation, from hill to hills to to inform. So the the cultural uh, expression was not only cultural, and um, it has also this political and social aspect uh, uh, of it. And um, so I. Um, and it happened that all this uh, cultural heritage was became today as a gift of the enslaved people to the uh, slave uh, societies. That is the paradox that I just uh, I just mentioned. So it became now the common heritage of that uh, of those society. And so it has exactly if the uh, the issue the question was to the social aspect. Definitely, this expression has that social and political dimension, and during the slavery time, and even uh, and even now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, and yeah, thank you very much. It's like a uh, if only we had more time, and we should expand our round table to the next workshop. I I I should ask the Wipik to. Uh, organize the uh, one more round table for the further discussion. We have only one, 10 minutes for the open discussion sessions, but we just uh, try to um, wrap up what we have learned and we also we, what we have discussed together. And uh, we, I'd like to give you the one question. Uh, so I hope that all of you can uh, share the very quick insights on the question. Uh, my question is, our question is not only insights of memory associated with a traumatic or dark past, but also in every heritage site, diverse narratives and voices can emerge, which then produces dissonance in heritage. Could you share your opinion on how we should understand the relationship between dissonance and solidarity in heritage? Do diverse narratives and voices interrupt or contribute to solidarity and heritage? So we have already discussed some of uh, some parts of this question, but just like a, that is a wrapping up last question for our open discussion. So, uh, so uh, Dr. <laughs> Bichna Kishic. Uh, could you please respond to this wrapping up the last question? Yes, I would say that kind of throughout my research and work, I've been advocating for this idea that we shouldn't be uh, dealing with kind of dissonant heritage only as heritage of kind of war and trauma and, and heritage that is openly contested at the particular moment, but it actually heritage in itself as an act of remembering and taking positions um, according to the past and build, building kind of future visions is kind of this very dissonant endeavor. And there's, if we recognize it, there's a diversity of voices, perspectives and living experiences in every kind of heritage, even more so in the ones that sit very comfortably in heritage sites and museums being not disputed because there is where we see a very kind of silenced marginalizations, oppressions and one-sided narratives. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, when working with heritage dissonance and bringing solidarity, what we have to be doing is uh, seeing dissonance mm -hmm. as a way to understand each other and each other's perspectives that sometimes are not reconcilable in a particular moment, sometimes are not harmonious. 
Mm-hmm. So it's more the question of how we live with these agreements, how we can negotiate and share the same space and build relations, even if we don't agree on the historic perspectives, nor on the current present interest and future visions. And I think this is the probably most difficult endeavor that we have to be doing. It's easy to be in solidarity with those that you agree with, and it's easy to be in solidarity if you can find a common ground or harmonious way forward. But living in solidarity when you don't agree, I think this is the virtue that we should all build up. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> very touched. Uh, yes, I totally agree that dissonance is a kind of the way to understand each other. So we shouldn't avoid the dissonance, but we sometimes we need to welcome dissonance in and also disagreement in between different stakeholders for the for the solidarity. Thank you. Uh, so, Zeze, could you please share your opinions with us? Please unmute your mic. Apologies. My opinion is very similar to Vishnia's and to what you were commenting. Um, Dissonance is a reflection of the collective, is a reflection of society. There is no homogeneity of of feelings and perceptions and experiences in society. And the exercise to move from dissonance to harmony, to to build this path, is, is the opportunity to build understanding, to uh, agree, to disagree, and to live, to, to learn to coexist and, and build peace. So this should be the transformative role of heritage is provide exactly a, a long time, that opportunity for those dialogues that are constantly making people live in, in peace, agreeing to disagree, uh, take place. And it's not necessarily the same throughout time. So that's why we can't expect a monolithic version of history to prevail forever, because it also it's uh, the significance of sites and of heritage changes uh, with time uh, or it has nuances of time. So I am also supportive of the fact that dissonance is an opportunity and we must be patient and work through it. Uh, And that's that's the work that needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ali Musaie. Yes, uh, no, thank you. Uh, indeed, I agree what my uh, predecessor said, and uh, dissonance is, I mean, uh, really uh, dealing with the memory, history, and heritage is always a challenging uh, uh, process. And because why? Because it concerns the most intimate uh, feelings and thinking of the people. I mean, it is the national uh, uh, identity, the personal identification. So it's a, there is a kind of psychological and even I can say psychiatric uh, dimension of, of, of this issue. So we need to learn how to address them with caution, with tact, and with a lot of, of, of listening. I think what is important here when in, uh, to, to, to manage the, the dissonance is, is to avoid, to learn how to avoid the blame, what I call the blame game. That is the first, always, because each community is one to, to express their, 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 their complaint against the other, because unfortunately so far, national narratives are built against other narratives, not, mm-hmm. not for or using uh, narrative. So it's, this is the normal way of narratives are built. So it's always against something. So I think uh, by bringing together in the discussion uh, scholars uh, who can uh, really help the people acquire the capacity to dialogue and, 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 and to discuss, I think it is a way to rediscover uh, the, the common heritage. What, uh, from my experience of the celebrity project, what I learned is any meeting became turned out uh, to become a, a therapy group. It became by anger, by shout, and then people calm down, and then they, they try to understand each other. And at the end, everybody agreed that we have to build our common future. We have to build a new way of living because 
by the way, we could not separate ourselves. We live in the same space. So what to do? To be fighting all the time or to just uh, trying to live together? I think people understand that kind of argument. When you say, okay, the past is the past. We have to understand it, but we have to build a common future. Then people say yes. And, and then they are ready to, to, comprom uh, you know, to compromise and, and, and to discuss. And, and this is part also of the process of healing. People need to be healed from the past, not only the people who suffer, but the people who are descendant of those who, who, who also, uh, I mean, perpetuated uh, suffering. It's important. So that's my response to, the, to this question. Yes, this is at least like a comment. This reminds me of the building we needed to build up the ethics of heritage and particularly difficult with a difficult past. We should approach distance with a very uh, ethical manner. Um, ethical. And <laughs> uh, Yaku? Uh, well, th thank you. Um, I mean, yes, I, I agree with, with everything that was already said, and, and the polyphony of voices, of, of experiences is, is something that we need to be, uh, that is important, and we need to be aware of, and, and it's possible to, be, to build a, a, a coherent narration that includes this polyphony, and I think European Union as an as a entity it could be a good example of such a, such a, 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 such a major process. Um, and again, I need, we need to acknowledge the dissonance uh, and, and always try to explain where does it come from and how those the same story is being told in different ways by different groups. Uh, to explain that is, is, is extremely important, but I think we, we shouldn't be com complied to accept those narrations. I mean, sometimes those narrations, those opposite na na narrations are fueled by stereotypes, by misconceptions. And I think uh, the next step uh, for educators, for, for historians, for musicians, is to be um, challenging those, um, those narrations which are uh, um, hurting other, which are based on false and, false and wrong uh, ideas. And that's certainly the next, uh, the next step. Yes, thank you very much. Education is, is also a very important matter to uh, deal with the dissonance and solidarity, towards the solidarity. Uh, Dr. Shumei Huang. Um, thank you. I uh, truly agree with uh, um, previous comments about uh, how business should be seen as an opportunity. And particularly for me, it, it, it can be an opportunity for remaking identity. Not, mm -hmm. not necessarily like giving up our um, own identity, but to embrace more fluid, diversified identity, because uh, a lot of dissonance that we can see from cases um, actually have to do with uh, our limit, our being limited by um, um, identities or associations themselves um, that might be products of historical violences and operation. Um, so dissonance, uh, I think, can offer ways for us to to rework this uh, identity and open up for new chances. Thank you very much. Wow, it's like a dissonance is also give us some other opportunity to remake identity. It's a very beautiful like a comment. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Dr. Stefani Luta. I was absolutely fascinated by uh, the presentations and I must say uh, those projects you've been working on um, were eye-opening. Um, what remains for me a very big question and I wish we could have had time to address this further is basically um, how do we coax out um, those silent voices, those who don't speak up um, and and aren't um, openly included in in inclusivity projects that we are hosting, but um, I think that would be one for the next <laughs> discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That is very important. We shouldn't neglect the silenced voices, uh, and then also we should think about how we can encourage them to speak out in the community as a member of community. Uh, thank you very much for your insightful presentations, questions, and discussions.
we should organize another round table <laughs> on the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. This repeat round table reminds us of the value of UNESCO World Heritage as a shared heritage. The UNESCO World Heritage Program helps us understand how heritage can be our heritage and how we can protect and love them with our shared responsibility and accountability. For the last 50 years, while celebrating together the outstanding and magnificent and excellent beauty of the majority of the World Heritage Sites, we felt connected as a global community. Now, UNESCO World Heritage gives us further opportunities to share others' pains, traumas, and difficulties with mutual understanding and empathy. To prepare for the next 50 years of the UNESCO World Heritage, we look forward to building up our new solidarity, and we firmly believe that the WIPIC will greatly contribute to it. Thanks for all your participation. Sujin? Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your full moderating and facilitating of the roundtable today. Of course, for our panels, Dr. Vishnia, Mr. Jeje, Dr. Ali, Mr. Yago, Dr. Sume, and Dr. Stephanie, I gratefully appreciate your brilliant and considerate contribution to WIPIC Roundtable 2022. And above all, I would like to thank all the audience who paid attention and listened to the whole session. I hope you all enjoyed it and got inspired by it. This is the end of WIPIC Roundtable 2022, but WIPIC is now hosting online lecture and webinar series about the World Heritage Interpretation and Presentation. You may have missed the first one held last Thursday, but you can still join the second lecture in September. Um, and also, I would like to apologize for a low resolution streaming via Zoom, but as I announced earlier, this roundtable has been recorded and will be uploaded to WIPIC's YouTube channel with Korean and English subtitles. It will be clearer version with better resolution. Uh, finally, I would like to hear your opinion on today's sessions, so please send us your feedback via our social media or email. Thank you again for joining us today and we hope to see you at WIPIC's upcoming events. Thank you. Bye everyone.